and it's entirely up up to you. Whoever wants to be on camera, you can. Um, looks like you all are muted mostly. Larry is unmuted. Judy's unmuted. I'm unmuted. See, Doug Stewart is with us from the East Coast. Hi, Doug. Hey, Doug. Rich. Hey, Judy. Hi, Doug. I'll I'll mute myself once we get started. So what's your next big project after Learn to Turn? Uh, we've been talking about Learn to Turn 2 and maybe updating all of the the DVDs to online program. That would be really online nice. Programs. Yes. That would be, that I think would be awesome. So we're, we're already talking with Billy about how we might do that. So uh, I'll give us a couple of months. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody's, all the young people are doing everything on their iPads and iPhones anymore. Right. right. They don't know how to work a DVD player. <laughs> yeah, most computers don't even have DVD players in them anymore. They That's don't. Right. That's right. All right, so we've got 20, 20 people in. Uh, one more minute, we'll get started, everyone. We've got a nice representation of folks from around, it's like around the country here, which is nice. Australia here. What's that, Brian? Australia. <laughs> oh, uh huh. Uh, Australia. So, what time is it there? <laughs> it's eleven a.m. 11 a.m. Oh, that's not not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. What's there? I am over there, isn't it? Yeah, we're at night where I am. 8 p.m., isn't it? Uh, in Idaho, uh huh. 8 p.m. Uh, p.m. Correct. 8 p.m. Yeah. yeah so we got uh, Gainesville, Georgia, is on. All right. So I'm going to get us started here, and uh, let me just do a screen share. So welcome to the open classroom. So basically this is, this is your opportunity to come in and ask questions. So uh, there's, there's not a formal program per se, although uh, some of you did submit some questions ahead of time. So we, we do have some seed questions to start with and I made a couple of slides on uh, one of them in particular that, that I think uh, might be of interest to everyone. Uh, there is a chat box if you know uh, how your system works uh, you should see along the bottom a, uh, a chat option which will open up the chat box uh, please feel free to type in questions and then once I get off of the, the first question here in the slides I'll go ahead and look in the chat box and we can answer any questions that are posed in there and I do have one poll that we'll get to uh, in a little bit as well so feel free feel free to ask any questions that you want and uh, so I'm, I'm just going to start. The first question was posed by Susan on the East Coast. And uh, her question goes like this. With most discouraging the 180 degree turn uh, after an engine failure on takeoff, we still see it discussed as doable. Of course, you may have seen some of the uh, AOPA write up on experiments they did in a couple of different airplanes. Uh, Susan also mentions that there's now an official study underway. I think that's being done by uh, some folks in EAA. Uh, in those precious split seconds for the decision and execution, how should we train for that scenario? And should it be the only best option? So I'm going to address that because it, it covers a lot of different topics that were available for you to select when you signed up for the open classroom. It covers stall spin awareness. It covers decision making. It covers risk management. It covers, of course, learn to turn, right? All of these elements come into play, certainly at a critical point in time where we're low on altitude, probably also slow in terms of airspeed, and maybe not with a lot of options. So really the first question that, that, that comes to my mind is, you know, why are we focusing on this now, right? So we've been flying, we've, we've had the possibility of, of flight for coming up on 120 years now. 
Uh, but it just seems in the last year, maybe two years or so, there's been a lot more discussion about uh, engine failure on takeoff and, and different people weighing in and, and even, even talking about incorporating it into, at least discussion-wise, uh, into uh, enhanced flight reviews. There, there was a study that was done uh, that looked at 300 general aviation accidents. So these are the actual accidents, of course. There are a number of, of events that were not accidents that, that we don't really have a good handle on, but at least 300 accidents, about 20 of them, 20% uh, involved a, a loss of engine power. And so to my mind, uh, it's a lot like somebody coming in and asking me, well, I I'm in a spin, what's the best way to recover? And so we're, we're, we've already arrived at that critical point in, in time and space when really the question is, what did we do to get there in the first place, right? Or what could we have done differently to maybe have avoided a full-blown um, uh, spin entry that requires now a spin recovery? And so, so yeah, we'll do, we'll do spin training, but more importantly, we'll do the, the awareness and prevention side as well, because typically if, if we're relying on our ability to recover from a spin, chances are in most cases, it's probably already too late. Good skill uh, and experience to have, but we have to have those other components as, as well. So that goes to my sort of approach in talking about the engine failure and takeoff. Let's, let's back up and, and go earlier in the process and talk about decision-making and talk about risk management. So the 20% that lost uh, involved loss of engine power, Number one, 20% of those involved fuel exhaustion and starvation. And of course, exhaustion means there isn't any more. Uh, that's a rough way to start a flight without any fuel. And then, of course, starvation means it's there. We're just not accessing it. Maybe, maybe we've inadvertently turned off the selector, uh, fuel selector valve, or we've selected the wrong tank, the tank that does not have sufficient fuel for the takeoff. Number two on the list, fuel contamination. That was 11% of these um, accidents. And so part of our job as pilot in command as part of our pre-flight is to check the fuel and decontaminate the fuel. In some cases that might require a fair amount of work to do. In other cases, uh, maybe one check of the sump and hey, everything, everything looks good. So exhaustion, starvation and contamination. These are all basically decision-making and pre-flight actions. And then number three on the list, 8% was carburetor icing. Um, some airplanes, of course, are more prone to this than others. And if the conditions are right, carb, carb uh, ice is not just a base to final, final to uh, landing uh, issue. It also occurs, you know, 8% of the time in this case on takeoff. So if the conditions are right and you have that kind of an airplane, that seems to be prone to carb icing, maybe you want to make sure you spend a little extra time, not just checking that you have carb heat, but leave that, leave that on a little bit longer and see if you're actually melting ice. So you, should, you would indicate a, a decrease in RPM followed by an increase in RPM as ice is melting. So we're not just checking that we have carb heat, but maybe also to see if, we're, if we have ice already as well. And so basically, if you add these three up, it's 39%, let's call it 40%, that's easy math. So 40% of these uh, engine failures, loss of uh, engine power on takeoff, have to do with things that we can probably do a much better job right up front. And if we do a better job of making sure we have fuel, we're accessing it, we've decontaminated it, and in those cases where carbides could be an issue, we've done our due diligence there to make sure we don't have any just to start the flight with, 40% of these accidents go away. And so we don't have to really talk about or worry as much about, well, what if we lose engine uh, engine power on takeoff? Um, the one issue that, that is, uh, can kind of skew these is the unknown causes were a fairly large percentage where they couldn't really determine what went on with the uh, loss of power. But between the unknown causes and number three on the list here are various mechanical issues with the engine. Uh, each of the different types are single digits. So, so those single digit ones are relatively rare. Basically, more often than not, uh, pilots put ourselves in, in a position uh, for good or bad things to happen. And, and, and I think any discussion about turnbacks needs to start with what can we do to prevent having to do that in the first place? The other thing as far as mechanical issues are concerned is if we pay much better attention to not only our pre-flight actions, but the sound, the feel, 
of the engine. In some cases, even the smell of the engine, maybe we can decide not to take off uh, if, if we suspect that there might be a problem, go back to the shop and, and have that looked at. So let's put this into perspective in terms of risk management. If you have fewer than 500 hours total time, and I know we have some student, uh, student pilots listening in, fewer than 500 hours total time or less than 100 hours in type. And these numbers kind of feel, if, you, if you've ever had to deal with airplane insurance, these are kind of familiar numbers in terms of how insurance quotes are broken down. Less than 500 hours total time or less than 100 hours in type, here's the reality. You are more likely to have an accidental stall spin than a genuine engine failure. By genuine engine failure means you've done everything you possibly can uh, and it's just some kind of a pure mechanical issue that out of the blue on takeoff. So if you have less than 500 hours total time or less than 100 hours in type, what should we really be focusing on, right? Uh, until we get past some of those magic hours. Of course, we never get rid of our stall spin awareness, but you know, in terms of where we want to put our effort and, and focus in terms of a, a training and under, understanding uh, standpoint. Um, Canadians did a study where uh, they looked at the risk of death or serious injury following turnbacks and, and they, they put it at about eight times greater when turning back compared to uh, basically going straight ahead, which has been the, the age old advice uh, for a loss of power on, on takeoff. And, and we're, we're assuming that these are all straight out departures. You know, if we're, if we're already on the crosswind or already turning downwind, we have more options at, at that point. So these are, these are the ones that are occurring uh, on the, uh, the departure leg here. Uh, there was a turnback study that was done with a simulator. The overall success rate of the turnbacks was about 62% compared to uh, the ability of the pilots in the simulation to control the airplane to a straight ahead. Um, and the overall success rate improved as the pilots practice more and were given more instruction in terms of how to conduct the turnbacks. But they, they still didn't match the 100% uh, in the straight aheads. NTSB, so I looked at for an article I, I was writing, <coughs> excuse me, I looked at a uh, NTSB database uh, for a one year period and I was looking for the, the intentional practice of turnbacks after simulated engine outs at low level. In other words, doing this in the traffic pattern, in a real traffic pattern on purpose, knowing beforehand that we're going to simulate this and there were accidents in the database as a result. Five accidents in the one year period. And the turnback success rate in these five accidents was about 57%. So you could read the narratives and it said, yeah, they, they did it the first two times and they made it back and the third time is when they stall spun in. So you can actually count, we count the ones where they made it, those were successes. And then obviously when they didn't, then that was the fail. And so, so this is where the 57% comes from. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and in total with these five, of course, there are two people on board in each case, eight fatalities, one serious, one minor injury. The minor injury was an FAA inspector who was doing a, a recheck of a pilot and, and cajoled the pilot into doing a simulated turn back at, in the traffic pattern, you know, in, in a real case, uh, killed, killed the, uh, the, uh, the person getting rechecked and the, exa uh, the, uh, the FAA uh, examiner uh, survived. So not a good success rate here, at least in the, in the one, uh, you know, the one snapshot. And, and the reality is in the turnbacks, if you make it, you're ace of the base. If you don't, well, then you're going to have a pretty high, high probability of uh, fatalities and, and or serious injury. So th there's really not a lot of middle ground uh, when we talk about the turnbacks. And so I'm going to talk about a, a little exercise here. There was a book uh, written by John T. Lowry, who's a pilot, also a physicist by schooling, called The Performance of Light Aircraft. And in it, he describes what's called his bootstrap approach, where you can take any airplane and by going out and doing a couple of test flights and taking some measurements, you can actually flesh out a legitimate, customized operating handbook performance charts specific to that airplane, not the generic ones that come from the manufacturers that 
cover all the airplanes, no matter no matter what they are. So, so it, it's a way to get hard and real numbers, performance numbers for a specific airplane. And in the book, he does he uses a Cessna 172 as an example airplane throughout, and he does a. Uh, he, he does different legs and does a calculation of a, of a turn back maneuver following an engine failure. And so here's the setup. Cessna 172, the most prolific airplane out there, 2,400 pounds weight, so max gross. Flaps are set at 10. It's set for a short field takeoff. Uh, and the flaps stay at 10 throughout uh, the simulation. It's coming off a dry level, 3,000 foot long concrete runway. The density altitude at the time of takeoff is 3,300 feet. There's 15 knots of wind in the simulation. 12 of those knots of wind are headwind. The other nine is a left crosswind component. The, uh, the climb is gonna be done at VX from 50 feet over the obstacle to 500 feet AGL. 500 feet is when the engine fails. Not meeting some the turn kind back of to the runway seminar. will be done at the oh, optimal okay. back yeah. angle, 45 um, degrees at the half optimal half? speed, which yeah. is okay, the stall speed at 45 degrees feet. angle of bank, okay. plus a yeah. little bit more. In other yeah. words, okay. you're going to be maneuvering at 45 right, degrees of right. bank with the stall warning horn going off close to the ground, right? So this is the optimal. All of this is optimal. And once we turn around, Right. Since there is a headwind, we're going to adjust the best glide speed by decreasing it by about three knots or so to take advantage of the wind. So we're doing everything in the simulation here in the calculation using real performance numbers for this 172, except for the, the initial takeoff part of it, which comes out of the POH. But once the airplane is airborne, it's, it's real numbers based on flight tests in this particular 172. And so uh, at this point, I'm going to, uh, for the first time ever, I'm going to launch a poll and see uh, how that goes here. And so engine out in our Cessna 172 from 500 feet AGL, can you make a 180 degree turnaround and return to the runway? So it's a compound question. There are two parts. Can you make the 180 and can you return to the runway? So you get three answers. You get to pick one. No and no. Yes and no. Yes and yes. So go ahead and and spend a moment, try the wrong answers. We're all here to learn, try to figure all this out. And we'll close the poll here in, in, a, in a moment or two. And I do see some of you have uh, posed some questions in chat. I'll be able to access that once I get off of, I only have a couple more of these slides and then I can get to the chat. Okay, so it looks like most have uh, answered. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here and we'll share the results. So as you can see, 20% uh, said no and no. So no, can't make the turnaround, which obviously means if you can't make the turnaround, you can't make the runway. So, so that's a pretty simple one. Yes, you can make the, the turnaround, 75% and 75%, but no, you can't make the runway. And 5% said yes on both. You can not only turn around, but, but make the runway. Okay, so let me stop sharing that for now. And let's come back here. So given all of this, after running through the calculations for all the different segments of the turnaround, all of this is done optimally, you end up short of the runway by 1,200 feet. So in other words, the airplane lands with a tailwind, it contacts the ground 1,200 feet short of the runway. And the thing is, is obviously if, if we change some parameters, what if the airplane is lighter? What if the density altitude is lower? Um, what if the runway is longer? What if the, what if the uh, winds are different, right? Uh, and we can talk about, well, maybe I'll, I'll add in a, you know, a, maybe a shallower bank turn, which that might cost a little bit more, but gives you a little bit more margin to uh, stall safety, let's call that. Uh, and so really the point is that you would need to do the calculations multiple times to sort of get a feel for how you're operating your airplane and, and what those different ranges are. It'll be different on different days because you have to factor in the wind. And you also have to factor in the density altitude. So, so basically everything matters here.
And so in this particular simulation, uh, yes, you can turn around, but no, you're not going to be able to make it back to the runway. You'll be short by 1,200 feet. And so uh, I don't know if, how many of you read Flying Magazine, but Russ Still, someone uh, I know with uh, uh, online, a uh, Gold Seal online ground schools, had a, a magazine article in Flying Magazine in October of this year. And he talks about the turn backs. And he has a really, really nice graphic uh, that shows, of course, during the takeoff roll, it's low risk. If, if you have some kind of engine problem, power off and stop, right? Uh, then you have the moderate risk. So you, you've broken ground, but you have some runway remaining. You're going to pitch down, make sure the power is off, land straight ahead. Then you get into the high risk initial climb, where uh, this is where he calls the impossible turn lives here. You're not going to be able to get turned around. Uh, and so it's the high risk area, pitch down, establish best glide, land straight ahead. And as you're gaining altitude, you're thinking of that, that, that slice of pie in front of you. That window is opening up broader and broader. Then you get into the moderate risk departure climb part of it here. And there's a transition. You have, you go from the impossible turn zone to the improbable turn zone to the possible turn lives here. And he puts it in parentheses, maybe. Uh, and then the airport's too far away. Like in the example we just did, yeah, we could turn around, but we're gonna be short of the runway. And in fact, we're gonna land with a tailwind push instead of the headwind helping to slow us down. And so as you look at this, right, the window of opportunity. So you have to have done all of the right things in terms of uh, accessing fuel, decontaminating it, no car ice, as far as you can tell, the engine's going to operate as it should. Um, and despite all of that, the engine quits. And it has to just so happen, has to happen when you're in that little zone where the possible turn lives, maybe. Uh, and even at that point, you have to execute flawlessly. Anywhere else, there is no turn back. There is no turn back. So ultimately, what is the probability that A, the engine is going to quit in exactly that little window where the, the turn is possible, B, you execute it flawlessly, right? And C, okay, on that particular day, yes, you, you get it back around to the runway. What's the probability that all those stars are going to align? Right. So we're really talking about a really, really small window of opportunity that requires no mistakes on the part of the pilot. Everywhere else here, doesn't matter what the terrain is. It doesn't matter if it's city, uh, you know, uh, urban area or non-urban area. It doesn't matter. Uh, you, there's only one choice. It's out in front of you somewhere. Of course, in a widening uh, uh, slice of pie as you go. And so this brings us to what happens when we crash an airplane. <clears throat> and so what I have here is a little chart that, that talks about in the vertical here, the minimum stopping distance in feet, and then the impact speed along the horizontal. So in other words, we start hitting stuff, whatever that stuff is, uh, terrain, trees, buildings, cars, doesn't matter what it is, whatever stuff we're impacting. Um, and as long as the stuff is movable, right? If, if you run it into the side of the mountain, the mountain's not gonna give, right? Uh, your stopping distance is zero feet. But as long as everything else can move a little bit, has some give, and the airplane structure itself has give. It's designed to crush and up to a certain point, give you a survivable volume inside and seat belt should stay bolted to the the frame and everything else. So if we look at this, the, the green line represents an impact, uh, uh, a two and a half, a two and a quarter G deceleration. So as you start hitting this parking lot of cars and they start moving and the airplane is starting to deform, you're feeling two and a quarter Gs on your body. And frankly, a lot of pilots I fly with routinely land at two and a quarter Gs anyway. So this is this is not beyond our normal experience, I would guess, uh, although we are contacting the runway more often than not at a pretty shallow angle. So if we look at 60 knots as an impact speed, uh, undergoing a two and a quarter G deceleration, we see that it's gonna take us, uh, oh, about 70 feet to come to a stop. And we survive. 
survive that, right? So we've pushed a bunch of cars away and car alarms are going off, insurance companies are getting involved, but we walk away from it. Well, let's, let's look at the design crash worthiness in our airplanes. They're designed for a 9G forward deceleration. If you go sideways into things, the airplane is not nearly as strong. If you fall vertically, uh, first of all, our spines aren't really designed for that, but neither is the airplane. But at an impact speed of 60 knots, undergoing a 9G deceleration till you come to a stop, if you look at the red line there, it's less than 20 feet. So if all it takes to survive is 20 feet under a 9G deceleration, you don't have to be looking for a 3,000 foot something that looks like a runway, right? So in the end, if we have a serious emergency in flight, isn't the number one goal to survive, right? The number two goal, survive. The number three goal, survive. Anything beyond that is bonus. I, I hope we, we would all agree that that's the case. So let's look at, this comes from a 1987 study that was looking at crash worthiness. And basically they started with a, a pile of accidents and they broke it down into two different piles. In this pile, they put all of the, the, the accidents where people survived. The other pi, uh, pile, they put all the accidents where people did not survive. And they boiled it down to two variables, the impact speed, so how fast are you going when you start crashing? And at what angle do you crash, right? What are you hitting things, right? If you were to stand up right now and run across the room and impact your wall at five miles an hour, 90 degrees, that's not gonna feel very good. And so you can see the relationship here. Uh, as impact angle goes up, the impact speed has to go way down in order to survive that. Conversely, if the impact speed goes up, the impact angle has to come way down as well. And so you can see you got the survivable crash zone and the non-survival crash zone. Here's the interesting thing. Impact speed and impact angle don't care what you're hitting. The trees don't matter. The water doesn't matter. The parking lot doesn't matter. The neighborhood doesn't matter from a survivability standpoint. None of that matters. It matters how you hit it. And so in the end, where you go, in a scenario like this is far less important than how you get there. And so this really needs to be the discussion we have about the turnarounds. Um, and, you know, really taking this, this, this broader look at it. What can we do to prevent, prevent being in that uh, position in the first place? And then what are our options? And how narrow really is that window where we might be able to execute the turnaround? And again, all the stars have to align. Engine has to quit at precisely the right time. A lot of times pilots will ask me, you know, what, do, what will I do if, if I know the engine's gonna quit at 500 feet? And my answer is I'm, I'm gonna level off at 499 feet, right? So I know that's a smart aleck answer, but you know, a lot of different ways of trying to resolve uh, different issues that, that people bring up. So I'm gonna stop the share for a moment and I'm going to come back on uh, a couple of the comments that we have in here. And I do have some other questions that are queued up uh, from before as well. And so this is from uh, Brian. And he's saying on the study, on studying the how to turn package, or the learn to turn package, uh, why the lack of emphasis on this aspect? Yeah, so that, that's a, an excellent question. Um, I've always contemplated, you know, let's let's do learn to turn one, which which I'm calling the basic learn to turn. And then we would have a learn to turn advanced where uh, part two, where um, we would actually do several of these simulations and, and go into a lot more detail, especially on critical maneuvering uh, like this. So so at some point, you know, the, the decision had to be made. Well, how far how far do we go with? I'll call it learn to turn one. Where do we cut it off? Uh, if we can get pilots initially to at least absorb the, the process or the concepts in learn to turn, I think we're, 
I, I think it opens up your ability to think about and uh, critically think about what it would take to do the turn back, right? Um, and so that's that's why we didn't go there with that and, and several other things that, that, that could have been included in uh, learn to turn one, which brings to, you know, brings me to another point. If a pilot does not fully understand, I mean, deep in their, in their soul, what the elevator, what effect the elevator has on angle of attack, airspeed, G load, critical angle of attack and turning flight, they have no business trying to do a critical turn back after an engine failure on takeoff because they will probably botch the turn. They will make the wrong inputs at the wrong time. All right, so let me continue with, uh, uh, with Brian's uh, commentary here. So started in gliders. Okay, so you know all about energy management and everything else, uh, level, uh, level one glider instructor rating. And yes, uh, the rudder scantily mentioned uh, during private pilot. Yes, of course, as a glider pilot, you know all about adverse yaw and the importance for, for needing rudder, but we tend to kind of not give it its due in, in a lot of primary training. And, and frankly, a lot of the training airplanes have designed so much of the adverse yaw out that you can sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, get away with it, even though, even though a, an in-tune instructor is probably someone like Doug Stewart is, is just waiting to do something to, to, to shake you up and say, hey, move your feet because I, I don't like how this is feeling all the time. Um, yet as a glider instructor turning a second nature, thermals, rudders vital, sensitivity, recognition of impending stall. Yeah, all very good points there. Uh, kept you out of trouble. Yeah, so all of that is that awareness part of it, right? And, and we become aware by opening ourselves up to allowing us to be aware, right? Um, what are my feet doing? What am I feeling? What am I hearing? What are my hands doing? How much tension do I have in my body? Where am I looking for information? Uh, and then he did aerobatic training. The first thing the instructor said on the first climate was, oh, you use your feet, good, yep. So you can tell when somebody comes. I've always found uh, and maybe Judy or Doug have experienced this as instructors as well. Uh, yes, glider pilots, they know how to use their feet. I've also found that people who ride motorcycles and come into to maybe transition to a, and are pilots as well, but transition to tailwheel flying, have a pretty good sense of balance because, hey, you better have if you're riding motorcycles around. Um, okay, so very good. And so I have a question. How many loss of control uh, in-flight loss of control of live pilots that have actually had instruction in gliders? Is it even known? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you can, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm guessing that you can do a, a query in the NTSB database that just pulls out gliders. And I, I don't know how we would do it to figure out what percentage of glider accidents right. or loss of control versus, does, versus does a fit? Or, or maybe the question is how many loss of in-flight oh. airplane involved pilot who had glider training. Yeah, really? I, I Do I need a sign? Yeah. There's some uh, yeah. academic yeah. out there that needs to do a master's thesis. Is there any board time? Yeah, there's a board underneath. So, uh, Timothy yeah. asks, yeah. Well, he said he hasn't read it, the yeah, uh, learned term. Um, an advanced organizer, the key points. Here's the key point. We'll summarize the 23,000 words can learn to turn into one key point. The elevator so makes you go in straight lines or circles, and it doesn't matter. Okay, I'll take one. Let me help you with it. Where do you want to? I will put it. I'll hold it. I'll put it in the Other back side? here. Back on my seat. Okay. My Here's card. A, the loose parts, so. Oh, loose parts yeah. in the in the, on the board, but it should be fine. Rope level. The answers I'll put the paperwork in the box, right? okay? There's very little scratching or, of the the upper levels of learning, squeeze it understanding, in there. education, or, uh, and especially uh -huh. correlation. To learn to turn. It's really I should have to have to drive a bigger car, huh? <laughs> Which is unfortunate because huh? learning is so fundamental, huh? and I, it's what gets people I in trouble. Have, like, uh, uh, it works fine as long yeah. as you know you're 20 or 25 degrees of angle in, yeah. in the horizontal. Okay. But when things become yeah. critical, you don't know how to turn and what the 
that's what you're going to do, then, then you will run into trouble. Uh, turning at 500 feet AGL, so this is from uh, Jeffrey. All right, thank you so much. If you turn around, if you are taking off in a congested area, will you not make the run less likely to injure someone? Yeah, so so this is a common, it, it, it's, uh, it's a, you know, it's a concern for others. So you're in an urban area, right? So if you know you're, you're um, departing, flying from urban areas, well, then you better really pay attention, right? If, if, you're, if you're concerned, really pay attention. Put fuel in the airplane. Access that fuel. Decontaminate that fuel. Make sure you don't have the car. Make sure your engine is, is operating. Here's, here's the issue in, in a lot of urban areas. Take Santa Monica Airport in Southern California, for example. If you're not going to make it back to the runway, you're going to land in some neighborhood. So all, by trying to turn back, all you've done is shifted which neighborhood the crash is going to occur in. And that's the reality. And so do we want to be able to control the crash in the neighborhood or have lost complete control of the airplane as it crashes into the neighborhood? That's a tough moral, ethical question and everything else. but. And I've even spoken to pilots who have said, no matter what, I will turn around. No matter what, because of that concern. And so, and my take on that again, in, in a heavily urban area, you're just putting your accident in a different neighborhood from the other one. Uh, and, and secondarily, if that's really your attitude, then you better, at least I think you owe an ethical and moral obligation to anyone who's going to get in the airplane with you to tell them exactly, hey, if the engine quits, I'm going to turn around and there's a very high likelihood that the outcome is not going to be good. Do you still want to go with me? So if, if we're going to carry that, uh, you know, all the way out there, hey, let's let's be moral and ethical all the way, including our passengers. But, you know, again, um, we can do a lot to reduce the chance of having an engine failure on takeoff and a complete engine failure, right? If uh, I'm sure most of us, uh, a lot of us can talk about all of the partial power. I, I've had two complete engine failures in my career, but a whole lot of partial power problems with engines uh, that have allowed allowed a lot of other options, right? So um, maybe some, some of you can chime in on your experience as well. So, uh, okay, so those are the questions I see here. Does anybody want to say anything out loud? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not just me talking. This is the open classroom. Anybody want to add anything, uh, any practical experience that they might have um, that that might benefit everybody in the group? Because I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm still learning, right? So going through writing, learn to turn, I learned even more stuff and hopefully better ways of presenting material than I did 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Um, anybody have anything to say? Larry, it looks like you're you're clicking in. Okay, uh, Larry, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, I, I don't I don't really have anything to say other than I agree with you on the on this turning thing. And the thing that concerns me a little bit is that we're talking about it so much that I'm thinking it's possible people are getting the idea that it's that it's you know it's damn sure possible and they're more apt to try it. Uh, yeah, and so what's that saying about a, a little bit of knowledge? And, you know, we really have to look, we, we have to look at it in as broad a way and as, as, as not only broadly, but deep at the same time. So in, in the cases where you hear pilots talk about all the time, well, 500 feet is the magic number in my airplane, right? Well, it depends on a lot of other factors, right? It may or may not. If if it's a if you're taking off with a five knot tailwind, that's different than if you're taking off into a thirty knot uh, Santa Ana headwind in Southern California, right? Uh, it's also different if you know everybody's leaving the pancake breakfast on Saturday morning and you're number one, and everybody else coming out at ten second intervals behind you, right? So so there's a lot more that goes in that is involved in in those kind of decision making, and it's. Not saying that it is a, an easy one. I see, hey, Doug, you have your hand raised. Go ahead, chime in. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, yeah, Rich. Uh, I wanted to address uh, what you were saying about making sure that everything's okay with the engine. You've talked about the fuel issues, the carb ice. Uh, in my work with the System Component Failure Power Plant work group, where we looked at fatal accidents uh, involving engine failure, 
especially those with takeoff, uh, one of the things that I came to realize is that many pilots don't make a conscious effort to check several things before they rotate, nor do they make a, a note of where their abort point should. And find that uh, on every takeoff roll, are you making sure that you are making full power, that you have oil pressure, that you have fuel flow, or fuel flow, that your airspeed is alive? And if you have that, that you're in the air at or before your abort point. And if you don't, the thing to do is to abort, and this is another way of eliminating it. But your comments about making sure that everything is right goes, uh, I agree with everything you say, but take it further. Make sure that everything is working in the takeoff role as well. Yeah, exactly right, uh, Doug. Excellent points. You know, uh, the the figuring out the abort point is something that's, that is that is a, a critical item in backcountry canyon fly, uh, and is something that we should we should apply even if there's 10,000 feet of runway available to it. So ec excellent points uh, there, Doug. Uh, anybody else want to chime in with anything? Um, let me ask, go to another page here. Okay, looks good. So I'll go to a couple of the other uh, uh, questions that were that were asked before. Uh, actually, two people asked, uh, Nahum and Alan, uh, both related to slips. And, and uh, one is a classic one that I see all the time. And that is, uh, I was taught to maintain coordinated flight in turns, yet forward and side slips are acceptable maneuvers and these are uncoordinated. <laughs> so typical flight training is from day one, instructors pound on their students, never, ever, ever, always, always, always fly coordinated. And then two days before the check ride, the instructor says, we're gonna go out and do slips. We're gonna go out and fly cross controlled. And there's a, a bit of a disconnect between, you know, what, what they've been told all this time and now what they're gonna, going to go uh, do. So, of course, it, it, in terms of our yaw control, we have we have three possibilities. Well, we have two possibilities and then something else underneath that. We have coordinated flight, which means uh, uh, yaw canceled flight. And then we have uncoordinated flight, which comes in two flavors, uh, skid and slip. And for our purposes tonight, let's just let's just picture basically flying in level flight. And, and we'll call the skid occurs anytime we have excess rudder in the uh, pointing toward the ground. And our slip would be any time we have excess rudder pointing toward the sky. And there, there's some other permutations of that, of course, but it, I think it makes it a little easier to visualize, especially when we talk about the skidding base to final turn where the pilot might be in a left base to final. So they're actually adding rudder to the left, pointing the rudder toward the ground, which in turn drags the nose uh, further below the horizon which makes the pilot react by pulling back on the elevator to try to fix the yaw problem. And now we have yaw and the potential uh, for stall, which leads to the spin. So one thing compounds on the other. The skid, there's no practical value for the skid unless, except as an efficient way to practice spins and spin entries. Uh, the slip on the other hand, we would have the airplane configured with basically the rudder pointed to the sky. So imagine yourself on final approach and you've got the left wing low, well, you have the right rudder applied and the right rudder is pointing skyward, right? It's, it's certainly not pointing at the ground. And so between those two, of course, the slip has a lot of utility to us, right? So we, we can use the slip to lose excess altitude. We can use the slip to offset uh, crosswind wind drift. We, use, uh, we can use the slip to counteract say a split aileron, a control uh, issue, a split aileron, or a jammed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a jammed aileron or a jammed rudder, a split flap. Uh, and I think somebody on here asked, well, what's one of the differences uh, you know, between twin engine and single engine? Well, you know, slips are available in twin engines as well if you have an asymmetric thrust event. So, so the slip is a nice utility maneuver uh, it shouldn't be just a throwaway that's done the day before a check ride and then pilots are left to figure it out uh, uh, on their own. And uh, the other thing that we confound uh, our terminology with is the difference between forward slip and side slip. Uh, a slip is a slip, right? The wing is down, the rudder is pointing toward the sky. Uh, we use the words forward and side in my mind to describe where's the wind coming from. So if you're on final approach and the wind is straight down the runway, you're doing a forward slip um, and you're doing that forward slip probably to lose excess altitude. If you're doing a side slip, 
you've got the airplane aligned with the runway, the wind's coming at you from the side, you're using the side slip to offset the, uh, the drift of the wind. And if, if you're in a side slip, let's imagine a, a left crosswind, you've got the airplane perfectly aligned uh, in your slip, the airplane's uh, perfectly aligned with the runway. If you could magically turn the wind off, where would the airplane go? Well, it, it would go in the, in the direction basically where the wind was pointing from, right? That's, that's where you would go. You wouldn't hold the runway uh, center line any longer. So, um, so those are some of the issues with slips and skids. Uh, in terms of how airplanes behave when they stall in a slip, it depends on the airplane. Uh, so Tabri Decathlon, they have good rudder authority. You can actually do a stall in a slip, stay in the stall in the slip, bob in and out of stall buffet, but basically stay on your track. High rate of descent, I don't recommend trying to land like that, but it continues just bobbing up and down on your track. Cessna 172, more limited rudder authority. If you stall it in a slip, even with full uh, slip rudder applied, there's not enough to maintain your track. So the airplane starts a slow slipping, stalling spiral. You can go 180 degrees around if you want. Uh, there's enough opposite rudder to keep it from spinning, but not enough to keep it on your track. The lowing airplane is the is a particularly potentially dangerous case because they will tend to lose their aileron authority in the slip uh, stall in a slip, and in those airplanes they will tend to start to roll up to wings level, and in the process of rolling to wings level, it's taking that rudder that was pointing at the sky, and eventually it's going to point it toward the ground. So there's a transition from a slip through wings level if you let it go far enough to a skid potentially to a spin. Take an A36 Bonanza as a good example. If you stall it in a left wing low slip, it takes about one second to go from left wing low to somewhere on its way to right wing low. So it could be, it's matter of fact. Um, it's not so fast that, that you can't just push forward and take the slip inputs out and get it in level flight. Uh, but those are the ones that are potentially more, more dangerous or at least more spin prone. Uh, compared to some of the others that I, I mentioned. So it depends on the airplane. Low wing tends to want to go over the top. High wing Cessnas do that slipping spiral thing. Uh, decathlon, you could just stay on your on your, on your track. So, um, all right, looking at a couple more things coming in here. Uh, slips are okay, skids look out. Yep, exactly right, look out below. <laughs> um, good. So. Yeah, we've been about 45 plus minutes in. Does anybody have anything, any questions? Again, this is, even though I'm doing all the yakking here, this is your time to interact, ask questions, uh, relay experiences. Again, as Doug mentioned, he was able to add a whole other layer to the takeoff roll part of it that that uh, I missed. And, you know, that's, that's good information. So anybody have anything they want to chime in with? Hi, Rich. Yeah. Hi, Judy. I'll chime in just a little bit. I just want to say that um, I, I owe a great deal to you and the training that I got from you because I've had, I've been an instructor, I've got several thousand hours now, but I've had an engine failure on takeoff. I was 100 feet in the air when my engine quit. And I can, I can just say from experience that I wanted to turn back. That was my first instinct. And the words that came out of my mouth were no. And, and I mean, I don't know if it's only you, but it's the training also. I feel like it's, we have to practice emergencies. So I think it's it's also, even when we're just talking about turning, we go out and practice deep turns and stuff when we do flight reviews or when we're learning to fly, but we're doing that under power. And it's also, I think, very important. And I see it a lot when I fly with people is their turns suck when they're not under power. You put them in a situation where they're gliding and the turns aren't real good. So I think it's important to go up to altitude, pull the power off, practice doing turns and getting comfortable because I can tell you, try to make a steep bank turn when you're gliding and you're gonna be losing a lot of altitude and a lot of times, Rich knows what I'm talking about. We see it all the time when we're teaching the uh, EMT course. People don't turn well. So just, I would just say, I wanna say thank you for everything you do, Rich. And, but the practicing I think is really, really important and I've had, like Rich, I've had the engine failure. I've had situations where I had a valve break once. Fortunately, I was right here in the traffic pattern. I was able to turn around. But to get my airplane down on the runway, I had to slip also. So it's really good to have those tools 
that, that available to us and to know how to use them because if, if you don't then you're kind of screwed and like that day if i didn't know how to slip then it was actually one of the flights i'd done with rich showing me you can pull the power off and put the flaps down and slip in a cessna 150 and get down really fast <laughs> so i just want to thank you for that hey well thank you judy and and you know, kudos to you for continuing uh, continuing the tradition there at Santa Paula with uh, unusual attitude training and the spin training and everything else. And and uh, very proud of how far you've come in your flying career. You've got more hours than I do now. And you know, I'm a one trick pony. You you can do the instrument flying, the uh, cross country racing, and you know, you, you got a lot more skills than I, I do at this point. But uh, but you're right. It, it's about the practice. It's also about the mindset, right? Because we are, we're all human and we're all going to have the same initial reaction. We're all going to have that second or two of, or the instinct, right? And in a lot of cases, our instinct is wrong, especially in the airplane. And so in that second or two where, where we have that startle effect, and we're all going to have it, it's just, do we have the training that we can break out of the startle and, 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 our brain takes charge again and tells our body what to do or does the startle shut us down and we're done right and so this is where the training comes in uh, and and it's not something that you uh, for example with the emergency maneuver training program that judy was alluding to we, we've done a lot of work with pilots whose whose entire mission profiles are low slow turning and looking at things on the ground and counting things on the ground fish and wildlife park service uh, uh, state troopers uh, uh, law enforcement and uh, you know the the key thing is you can go through a program relatively short programs you know three hours six hours whatever that might be uh, and it's not something you need to do the next month or the next month after that most of those pilots come back and and do recurrent on a typically a three-year cycle and that's about right so we all have to do flight reviews so why just do the same old thing in terms of flight reviews uh, Challenge yourself. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. Uh, find a place where where they will push you to look at things in a little different way. To uh, uh, you know, really stretch your envelope a bit. I see uh, Hal. You've got your hand raised. So chime in. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Hal, are you there? Okay, so Hal, if you can unmute yourself, uh, chime in. Got uh, two questions, uh, actually the, the same question from two folks, uh, Jim and Timothy. Um, no, no dunces in the room here. Uh, get my brain wrapped around the concept. So if you go to uh, communityaviation.com or even to my website, uh, richstoll.com, you'll see a link to Learn to Turn, which has um, a almost 100 page uh, e-booklet free to download that uh, talks about what the controls do and and turning flight uh, which is not just horizontal uh, it involves a vertical and and the oblique as well uh, and there's a webinar recording there and the video and all those kinds of things uh, bottom line is this there are only airplanes only follow one of two flight paths we're either going in a straight line or we're going in a circle or a curve and it doesn't matter where in space that is. It can be a, a vertical 360 degree turn, which an aerobatic pilot will call a loop. It could be a 360 degree turn in the horizontal, which you could call a horizontal loop, or it could be something between those two. Um, and so the question is, it has nothing to do with forces and moments and all of that physics and engineering stuff. It has to do with if I, the pilot, do this with the controls, what is the airplane going to do as a result? If I have an action, the airplane will have a consequence. How do I make the airplane go on a straight line? How do I make it go in a circle? And what determines whether you're following a straight line or a circle is what you do with the elevator. And we'll give you a perfect example. I'm going to assume that all of us fly a stabilized approach on final to landing. That is a straight line, a diagonal line, but it's a straight line. And I'm assuming that all of us at some point will change the angle of that line to a straight line that parallels the runway, right, for landing. What is that transition from the diagonal line 
from a stabilized approach on final to the straight line that's just inches above the runway as we're going. To, what is that? It's not a straight line that connects those two. It's a curve. And what made the curve happen? Your round out. The FAA even calls it a round out. You apply aft elevator to do a little piece of a vertical turn, a little piece of a loop, a low energy little piece of loop to change the path from a straight line to a curve to another straight line. And it applies the same way in the horizontal. And one of the ways you know that is when you start doing steep turns, if you don't pull the right amount of G for the angle of bank that you've set, let's say 60 degrees, because that's easy, you must pull two Gs or it will not be a level turn. It'll, if you pull more than two Gs, it will be a climbing turn. If you pull less than two Gs at 60 degrees of bank, it'll be a descending turn. Still following a circle, but they're different circles. The elevator is what makes all of that happen. So hopefully if you go through the written material, that'll, that'll help uh, with a little better understanding of that. There are exercises in the booklet that you can go out to really sort of exaggerate some movements to really see what's going on uh, with the elevator. And it's not a new concept. It goes back to stick and rudder. And it actually even goes back before stick and rudder to the early 1940s where you can find these references. And I don't know why they're not, you know, uh, talk to pilots on very early in flight training. If you do this with this control, this is the result. If you do this with that control, this is the result, right? And everything we build, all maneuvers are built from the same fundamental uh, three things that we can do in the airplane. Uh, Brian, you have a question from down under. Yeah, Rich, I just, well, not a question, really, just a, just a comment. In gliders, you join downwind, thousand feet, same circuit as everybody else, but you commit it. You know, the powered aircraft, you're not committed. I assume your engine is running. Mm -hmm. And so every landing that we do in a glider, is a, is, we're committed to it. And oh, I just think there's just so nowhere near enough emphasis on 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 landing without power. Um, sure, I mean, you know, obviously we've got to be able to land with power. I mean, that's the natural thing to do. But if you don't practice that landing without power all the time, exactly the sort of things you've been talking about is what's going to happen to people. And I reckon that's the loss of control. Um, one of the big issues, because what I know over here is that the number of accidents as a portion of the number of flights from loss of control in gliders is about 20% of that in powered aircraft. Mm -hmm. And I think that's purely because your mindset is you're committed so you got to do it right. Right, right. And and again, that goes back that goes back to the practice again, right? We yeah. we we of course if you come in and train with me or with Judy, um, all of our landings, unless traffic or something else uh, is a factor to us, they're they're all gonna be powered off approaches at some point, whether it's a beam the number somewhere, power's gonna come off and you're gonna manage the energy, manage the speed down to a landing, right? So so basically we're in a we're in glider mode at that point, right? And and you're right. If if you're always relying on the power, what ha it's it's a different, slightly different animal without the power. And so that energy management, you you can't save it by adding more power. And so one of the ways to kind of know if you're on the right approach profile, right, is it if as you're getting closer to the runway on final, if you're adding more and more power, you're on the wrong side of the approach profile, right? Uh, we're low. If we're finding ourselves steadily able to reduce power, yeah, we're on the higher side of it. And somewhere between those two is a place where we shouldn't need the power. And, and of course, that's gonna be different depending on the winds, but it's good to practice gliding approaches, power off approaches in different winds. So we know, hey, I've gotta be closer in. I've gotta, I've gotta judge it my turn sooner. I've gotta make these adjustments. And if there's no wind, well, right? And, and if we've never done that, if it's always been relying on the power, then it's not going to be uh, as comfortable to us or, or as natural to us if, if we really have a scenario where uh, it's not available to us. Okay, so we're coming up on the, uh, the hour. Anybody else have anything they want to chime in with? Feel free. I don't see any other hands raised at the moment, but 
you don't have to raise your hand. You can just unmute and, and jump in. I just think that it's a fantastic package you put together, Rich, and I'm really glad that David Goldington, who you might know, put me onto it. All right. Well, I'm 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 glad. Uh, say hi to him if you would. And one of these days, I'm threatening to get down there. I've gotten as close as New Zealand, but I know that doesn't count. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I appreciate everyone taking the time out to come in here. Like I said, a, a little less formal with the open class, uh, your opportunity to ask the questions and everything else. Uh, one last one last shot if anybody has any anything they want to say. Otherwise, uh, be safe out there. Practice. Uh, try some different things. Stretch your, stretch your operating envelope. Stretch your comfort zone a little bit. And uh, thank you. So hope to see you out there in the pattern at some point or at some flying event. So, all right. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Good night, Rich. Thank Thanks you. a lot. All right, Rich. Thanks, Bailey. Bye. Thank you.